managing editor of The Knitting Circle, Jen, say hello. Let us know how it's going for you. Hey everyone, like Leah said, I'm Jen, managing editor of The Knitting Circle. I'm so excited to be here today to talk about our summer crafting party. I know we've done some of these for some of the other holidays and I'm really excited about this summer one. Lots of good projects this time. Perfect. And next I'm going to have us say hello to Kelly Ashton. She is our quilting expert and also a craftsy instructor. Hello and how are you doing, Kelly? Hey everybody, I'm doing really well, except for it's blooming hot where I am today. So we're all melting just a little bit, but I'm really excited about this kind of intro to summer crafting week that we have next week. And I'm delighted to be part of it. This will be the first one that I have uh, joined in on and I'm really tickled to be um, one of the instructors and I'm looking forward to seeing a bunch of y'all next week. Perfect. Now, before I'm going to go back to Jen and Kelly and let them give us a little sneak peek into the project that they're bringing to us, quick little bit of housekeeping from me. So we've got that live instruction all next week and a bundle of free summer patterns for you. So every day next week, a new instructor is providing step-by-step -step live demonstrations of relatively easy projects for you to jump in on either live as we're streaming, or you can do it on your own time a little bit later. The first official day of these mini series is going to start on Monday that's June 21st and the time is 2 p.m central but you can start downloading your free patterns and instructions right now so you can get prepared for the live instruction next week the link is in the description and we are going to get a little sneak peek of some of the projects in today's little back and forth session here with Jen and Kelly. Uh, so before we dig into any questions from you, which are going to be in the chat box, I'm going to keep an eye on that throughout our entire hour that we have together. I would like Jen and Kelly to give us a little intro into the project you'll be seeing from them next week. So I'm going to give them a chance to let us know what inspired them to create this project and maybe branch out, talk a little bit about what kind of projects you like to make in the summer overall, even if it's not that specific project you brought. So let's go ahead and start with Kelly. What inspired you and what other types of projects are you excited about for the summer? Well, thanks so much. And what inspired me really was just thinking about um, pretty much the 4th of July, because that's like the big holiday that's coming up. And I thought, oh, it'd be really fun to do something that just, um, for quick and easy get togethers, a little table topper, a way to entertain and have it be festive. So what we're doing, and when you download the handout, it looks like this. It's called Fireworks Fun Table Runners. And it's so quick and easy because really what we're doing is focusing on one unit. And then I'm gonna show you how to take that one unit and reconfigure it um, into several different block options. So the first one is called the Sparkler Table Runner. So when you download your project um, packet, you will see this is one of the projects on the front. And then a, the second table runner is called the Sparkler Table Runner and it looks like this. But I'm also gonna show you how to use the same unit to create a third block and then you're gonna have all kinds of options. So you can make a table runner using the same block across, you can mix and match, you can put you know, three different blocks together. We're gonna to have so many options to play with this thing and it's so fast and easy. I think we're gonna have a wonderful time, so. Perfect, now would you say if somebody is new to quilting that this would be something that could be a first project? I would say that as long as they have basic rotary cutting um, skills, and some basic piecing skills that they'll be fine because I'm gonna take them through step-by-step step to how to create the unit. And then once they create the unit, it's just reproducing it. And then it's all about how we lay those units together. So as long as they have basic rotary cutting skills and some really basic piecing skills, they should be fine. Perfect. Well, I'm excited to see it next week in the flesh. Uh, I'm going to move next over to Jen. Jen's got a project for us. So same questions to you, Jen. What inspired you to create this particular project? And if you have any other exciting summer projects that you're looking forward to, share those as well. Yeah, so for the knitting project, we're going to be making a summer stripes dishcloth, or also I have it in a placemat size. 
Um, and so really with this project, I wanted to make something that was just very beginner friendly. I know from the other uh, crafting series we've done, we have a lot of people that are sort of new to knitting. And so I just wanted a really fun and easy beginner project. But if you're not a beginner, you're going to love this too. This is actually one of my favorite stitch patterns. I've used it so many different times. So all you're going to need to know how to do is how to knit and purl and cast on bind off, but I'm going to show you how to do all those things when I demonstrate how to do this next week. And I just wanted to make something really fun, really simple. Both of these are made out of um, dishcloth cotton worsted weight yarn that you can pick up for very inexpensive at the craft store. And um, really you can make a whole set that match. You can make them fun and funky. It's a great use of leftovers if you have leftover kitchen cotton. Um, so I'm really looking forward to making this. And then as far as projects I like to knit in the summer, I know that this seems kind of weird, but I actually knit a lot of socks in the, in the summertime. And the reason I knit a lot of socks in the summer is because they're so small and portable. So I'd rather be working on larger projects in the winter when I can like sort of like hide, like knit a blanket in the winter so I can knit on the blanket while I'm hiding under the blanket, like under the blanket. But I actually do like to knit things like socks in the summer because they're so small and portable. It's not too hot to be carrying around with you. All right, well, thank you so much for sharing those sneak peeks with us. Uh, this is the part of our session today where we are going to start some question and answer. So we do have some questions that we already have ready to go, and I'm gonna get to as many of those as possible, but really, this is where you all that are viewing at home can come in. Uh, some of you have already found the chat box. You're sharing where you're viewing from. Please go, feel free to say hi, hello, let us know where you're watching, what you're excited about, uh, but if you have a question for our instructors, go ahead and put that in the chat box and we'll get to as many of those as possible as well. Uh, and we'll do this all the way through pretty much the hour that we have available. So get your questions in, we'll get to as many as possible. And I'm going to go ahead and start right off the bat with one of our questions that we had saved for this. Um, and I'm going to give you each a chance to answer this and we'll stay with Jen here first. Jen, what is a crafting tool that you cannot live without? You have to have it. I have to have it. Well, if I'm thinking about knitting, um, I would say as far as a crafting tool knitting wise that I feel like I absolutely can't live without is stitch markers. I don't use a lot of stitch markers in my knitting as far as like mar marking um, like stitch repeats and things like that. But that's one tool that I feel like, you know, other than like the needles and the yarn <laughs> um, that I couldn't live without. Like I, I like having them to mark the right side, wrong side of my work. Um, I do like to have them sometimes to mark things like edge stitches or where I'm going to do increases and things like that. So I feel like that's like my one other tool other than the yarn and needles that I have to have when knitting. All right, Kelly, what about you? What's your go-to tool? Must have it in your toolbox. Well, I, I'm going to list a couple of things because first of all, I absolutely could not and would not want to live without my rotary cutter mat and rulers because they have just been such a game changer, you know, for quilt making when they first came out and they still are just so wonderful and popular rather than to having cut everything out with scissors. But one of the things that I have found really recently that I absolutely adore is a fabric roller like a, a presser, a presser tool. So it's got a handle, it's got this little round, um, looks like a steamroller roller on it and you hold it in your hand and that way you can, um, it's kind of like finger pressing on steroids because you've got this tool. And so you can finger press a seam without having to get up and run to your pressing station when you just have some small seams that are in the way before you can move to the next step. And that thing has been a lifesaver because I keep it right next to my sewing machine. And then I just have it right there to do my little pressing so that I can just keep stitching till I can finally take a larger piece to the iron. All right. Oh, we've got a couple questions here that I'm going to throw back to Jen right here at the beginning. Um, first, a question here from Tyson. Uh, oh, from Newfoundland, Canada. Hi, Tyson. Uh, Tyson's curious um, if the knitting can apply to mosaic knitting. And also, Tyson is very new to color work. Oh, so I think what maybe they're asking is if this is mosaic knitting, 
I think that might be what they're asking. So um, this is a form of slip stitch color work. Um, and so, yeah, if you're familiar with mosaic knitting, then yes, you can absolutely do this. And also if you want to get into more complicated mosaic patterns, this is like a great place to start because we're only going to be working one color every two rows. So we're basically working um, in this example, we have the red, you're working it for two rows, switching to the white. So you're never having to carry your yarns or anything like that. And that's exactly the same with mosaic knitting is that you're using one color at a time. So yes, if you're familiar with that, or you want to learn about that, this is a great project for you. All right, I'm gonna stick with you for the next question as well from Nadine. Um, Nadine wants to know if we are going to have something for crochet for the ones that do not know how to knit. And I thought maybe Jen, you would have some thoughts on our crochet friends out there. Yeah, so um, for this particular series, we don't have a crochet project this time, um, but in addition to having the Knitting Circle website and Craftsy, um, we also do have a new um, crochet site, the uh, Creative Crochet Corner, and that's the website, creativecrochetcorner.com. And so while we don't have crochet for this particular series, because that website just launched, I am sure that in the future with some of these crafting series, we are absolutely going to incorporate crochet. And I love to crochet too. So I can't wait for that to happen. <laughs> yes, um, actually my background, if I have any at all in crafting is more crochet. And I find the knitting videos to be accessible even if crochet is your background. So if you're thinking even a little bit about dabbling into the knitting side, this is your series to give that a try. So mm -hmm. feel free to jump in and watch and maybe try it out. Yeah. Um, I'm going to swing over to Kelly here for our next question. Kelly, there's a lot of enthusiasm for the table runners. And Donna has right. a question about the block size. So what is the block size on that cute table runner that you showed us? Sure. The block size for this table runner, I'll just hold the first one up again. The block size is eight inches finished. So eight inch finished square. And each of the table runners has three blocks in it. And the finished size of the runner is approximately 15 inches by 31 and a half. So it's a really nice size, you know, for a tabletop or even to hang on the wall. But the cool thing is, is if you really wanted to make it smaller, you certainly could with just a two block if you have a smaller table where you wanted to use it or even make it bigger. So it's just keep in mind if you do that, that um, the fabric requirements for the borders don't reflect a change in size, but certainly that's something that you could do on your own if you wanted to, to change the size yourself. But the blocks are eight inches finished. All right, and another question right here for you, Kelly, is from Freda. Uh, Freda is curious if there are any special tools that are required for the quilting project. Um, the only thing that you're gonna need, of course, is your rotary cutter mat and ruler, your sewing machine, unless you're a hand piecer, because I am not. Um, and I think I listed probably uh, maybe a square ruler in there because a, a smaller square ruler can really be helpful, but it's all in there. There's nothing really special, probably nothing that you don't already um, have at home if you uh, have been quilting at all for a period of time. So shouldn't be anything that's a surprise. Yes, and for anybody that missed the very beginning of our hour here today, uh, you can go into the chat box and find the link to all of the instructions. So if this is something that you wanna plan ahead for and have your things ready, you can find the tools that you need for every project, not just the quilting project in the download that you would have. Uh, all right, let's move into our next question here. Oh, this is, I'm gonna send this to both of you and we'll start with Kelly since you're all ready to go. Uh, who is your favorite person to craft with? So family, friends, uh, how do you make it a social activity? Oh gosh. Well, I actually um, own a, a, an artist retreat. And so I do a, a monthly uh, open sew and we have a, there are just, I mean, it's open to whoever wants to join, but there's a core group of people that have been coming almost every time, if not every time for the five plus years that we've been open. And so I love getting together with those people. I look forward to it every month because I find typically I, I sew a lot by myself. Um, I find it to be a very relaxing, soothing, almost Zen experience for me, but I certainly do enjoy being around people as well. And so that just gives me an opportunity almost once a month to get together with people that I've gotten to know pretty well and we get to catch up and we get to spend time doing what we love doing. And it's really great. So 
All right, Jen, how about you? Who do you like to uh, take on some crafting with? What makes it fun? Um, you know, I have a knitting and crochet group that I've been knitting and crocheting with for, I don't know, 15 years or something like that. Um, so those are probably my favorite people to craft with. Um, you know, obviously before the pandemic, we would meet like about once a week or every other week and we'd meet at a coffee shop or restaurant and hang out, eat, drink coffee, knit, crochet, whatever crap. Sometimes some other crafts would sneak in there too. Um, and so, and over the last year, we really have um, tried to maintain that as much as we can and, you know, still have our knit and crochet nights over Zoom and things like that. But um, we do everything. We go on retreats together. We go to fiber festivals together. And um, that's a really great thing about crafting is, you know, my current uh, knit and crochet group, I did not know any of them before I, you know, sort of got into the craft. And that's what part of what I love about it is that you can just make so many friends just from your craft alone. You already have so much in common and you can just talk about the hobby you love so much. Yes, indeed. And uh, I am gonna take another little pause to point people's attention to the chat box because if you have a moment to scroll through, you'll see that even the online community that we have that attend these live uh sessions and crafting displays and all of these live demonstrations, the comment section is full of people that are crowdsourcing, just saying hello, sharing a bunch of things from where they're from. So it's always a great thing to do online as well, which of course I think has been fantastic in this past year. <laughs> okay, let's go into another question here. Uh, and we'll start with you, Jen, again, since you are ready to go. Uh, what advice do you have for someone that is new you know, knitting for you or even any other crafting in general that wants to start out? Yeah. Um, you know, I think if you're new to any craft, it can seem really overwhelming. And I'm even experiencing that a little bit now because I do want to try to get into quilting and sewing. And I'm very much a beginner and you just have no idea where to start. Like it can be very overwhelming at first. But, um, you know, obviously we have Craftsy, there's lots of great online resources and really, especially with knitting and crochet, you can get started as far as supplies go for pretty inexpensive. I mean, yes, you can spend $500 on yarn for a sweater if you want to, but you don't have to. For example, this project here, this is, you know, probably $5 worth of yarn or something plus the needles, you know, so um, just don't be afraid to get started in every hobby you know, sort of has those different levels of, um, you don't have to get in for the most expensive things at first, I guess is what I'm trying to say, is that you can start it out, watch some videos, learn from a friend, and then, yeah, if you want to take it up a level and, you know, get the better needles or better sewing machine or whatever, you can do that, but just don't be afraid to try it. And remember that all of us here, the ones that are even teaching, um, you know, these classes or these sessions next week, all of us were beginners at some point, you know, whether that's whether we were five years old or 25 years old or 40 years old, whatever, we all were beginners in our craft at one point. So just go for it. Perfect. Kelly, do you have anything to add to that? What would you suggest for some of our beginners out there? Well, I think what Jen said was really true. It's just, you know, if you find something that you're interested in, don't let, don't let the overwhelm hold you back because there are so many people, there are so many resources available online or um, for quilting, you know, you can just go to your local quilt shop and they are so happy to offer you advice to, to show you and point you in the direction of, of a nice, easy, simple beginner project. Most quilt shops and, and now of course online on Craftsy or, and all of our sites, you can find uh, introductory classes into either a, a simple project or just fundamentals. And so, the resources are really there. So just like Jen said, just go for it. Just dive right in. And it doesn't, it's not going to be perfect at first. And good grief, it, mine still aren't perfect. But, you know, we just continue to hone our skills and hone our skills all the time. We're not looking for perfection. We're looking for a way to really um, exercise our creativity and our desire to make things. And so just have a great time with it and just don't hold back. 
Okay, now the next question that came in was specifically about knitting, but Kelly, I'm gonna send it a little bit to you as well because I think it would be a good one for anybody to have a heads up on. Um, for somebody that has never, in your instance, quilted before, uh, would they be able to learn the basics with your project for next week? Or is there something you think they might wanna take a peek at, a video you could point them to ahead of time? Um, that's a really great question. I think if they don't have basic rotary cutting skills and some very basic piecing skills, I think this project could be overwhelming because there will be some initial cutting that um, I'm asking people to do before we ever get started on Monday, just so that we can move through the project. So um, now that doesn't mean that watching it, um, you probably would pick up some things watching it on Monday, but you might not want to dive in and sew along yet without having some fundamentals. Now I know that there are some some basic, some good basic classes on both Craftsy and National Quilter Circle. And you can just kind of go on and look for intro classes for quilt making to give you some of those rotary cutting fundamentals, for example, and just to kind of get used to the jargon and that sort of thing. But, but please feel free to join us on Monday and just watch and participate that way because I'm sure that you'll pick up some things that then can translate on later on and download the pattern because you can always save that and work on it after you um, you know develop those initial skills because it really is in the grand scheme of things it's a pretty simple project but there are just certain foundational pieces of information that you really want to have before you dive right in because you don't want to set yourself up for frustration and we sure don't want that for you either. Uh, and before I send that question over to Jen, um, I'll just highlight that every single one of the projects that we do in the series next week, you can go back and rewatch those videos. So we actually have a mix of people that are sewing, quilting, knitting along. And we also have a bunch of people that are watching just to take some of these tidbits of information to when they get to their project later. And you can always do that as well. Um, so Jen, I'm going to send it to you, uh, knitting specific with your project. If somebody has never knitted before, would they be able to learn the basics? Um, and if not, where would you point them if they wanted to check something out ahead of time? Yes. So I feel like my project is definitely beginner friendly. And I would even say it's a great beginner first knitting project. And so it's just like Leah said, um, you know, I'm going to be doing it live, but you'll be able to rewatch it later. And I'm going to show how to do everything from casting on, doing the stitches and then binding off. So you will have all the skills that you need there. Um, probably the trickiest thing with this particular pattern is that we are going to be handling two balls of yarn sort of at the same time. They're going to have two balls of yarn attached to our project at the same time but I'll show you how to handle that as well. And if you feel like you need a little bit more help as far as learning the knit stitches and purl stitches, um, on the Knitting Circle website, we have a 14 day learn to knit series, which is absolutely free. And so um, you can go and watch videos and there's a video just on the knit stitch, just on the purl stitch, just on casting on binding off, et cetera. There is a project that goes with that series too. That is also a great beginner project, but I feel like this project will, will be a great beginner project as well. Um, and again, it's one of those things where you can go back and you can watch the video later if you need to. Um, I do knit with the yarn in my right hand. I knit English or throw. Um, so that is what I will be demonstrating um, when I'm showing how to make the project just because we only have an hour. Um, but if you go to that 14 day learn to knit series and you are left-handed, um, in that series, I do show how to knit with both the yarn in your right hand or your left hand. So if you're left-handed, you can see um, you might some, most people who are left-handed find it easier to hold the yarn in their left hand. So um, yes, but a beginner can absolutely do this project. Oh, Jen, you answered the next question. Oh, good. <laughs> So Susan was very curious about the left-handed uh, situation and Susan, you're not alone. Um, I know Jen gets this question a lot. Mm -hmm. So like she said, check it out. She'll point that out, but check out that intro series and that would be great. Right. And I can, during, um, during the live next week, I can quickly show like, this is how you'll do this with your left hand. It's just the majority of the project, I am going to hold the yarn in my right hand because that's how I naturally knit. But you can always go back to that learn to knit series if you're not sure 
about um, how to do a knit or purl or whatever with the yarn in your left hand. There's also a class on, um, on the knitting circle, um, an entire class. If you truly knit left-handed as in the mirror image of sort of the traditional way of knitting, there is a left-handed knitting class on the knitting circle website as well. Okay, Kelly, I'm gonna come over to you for the next question here from Kayla. Uh, Kayla asks, when I find fabric that I love without a specific project in mind, I struggle with deciding on how much of that fabric to buy. Do you have suggestions for that situation? Oh, Kayla, I, I, I sympathize because I have the same issue. Um, there are a couple of ways that I sort of approach that. If it's a large scale print and you immediately see it and think border, for example, for your quilt, then think about how the size quilt you typically like to make. Because if you want a bed size quilt, a queen or even a king, then you're going to want to get at least four yards so that not only will you have enough for your borders, but you might be able to then use it in some of your blocks in the project as well. If you typically like to make smaller projects, but still want it for a border, think about the average size and then get the amount that you would need for borders for that size and add another half to three quarters of a yard again so that you can put some in your blocks. Um, if it's a smaller scale print and you just think, oh, this would be a fabulous background, once again, or you know, negative space kind of fabric, then once again, think about the size quilts you typically like to work with. If you like to make a bed size quilt, gosh, with, with a good negative space fabric, I will go ahead and buy three to four yards, even though that might be enough for two projects, just because I never want to run out for whatever project I might decide to put it in. And then I'll probably have enough to, to incorporate into another project as well. So it just kind of depends on your typical go-to size of your project. But um, if you're not sure, I mean, if you just look at it and go, oh my gosh, I love that fabric and I have no idea, I would go ahead and get at least four yards just so that you know that you've got it, you can use it in whatever projects you use it for, and then you've still got some in your stash or you can share some with a friend because if you love it, you know you're gonna find somebody else that loves it too, right? So I would just always have an abundance rather than be a quarter yard short once I get started into a project. Uh, oh, and Kelly, we're gonna stay with you too. Um, Damali is admiring the quilt behind you and asks, is that a tumbler block? It is a tumbler block quilt and thank you for noticing the quilt and I'm glad that you like it. Um, I actually cut this on an AccuQuilt Go cutter using their large tumbler die, which is a six inch die. And um, I absolutely love it. It was so much fun to do and it goes together so quickly that um, you know most of the time beginners start with a project that's based on a square. But honestly, if you're an, a novice quilter, a tumbler is a wonderful shape to work with because it's really easy to work with. And yet it just has that little bit of an interesting angle to it as you're using the tumblers that just as it has a little more flair than maybe just putting a lot of, of um, like five inch squares together, for example. So it's a fun shape to use and I would encourage you to try it. All right, and I've got a question that I'm gonna have both of you answer. So we'll stay with Kelly first. Uh, speaking of projects that you have already done and completed, what would you, thinking back, call your favorite project that you've ever done? Oh my gosh, that is such a tough question because usually I say my favorite project is the one that I'm currently working on because it's the one that I'm most excited about in the moment. I mean, I am visualizing it in my head. Sometimes I have a sketch but the sketch always evolves as I move through the project because as I'm putting things up on the design wall, ideas continue to evolve and shift and change. And so the project evolves the whole time that I'm making it. So I'm always excited about the one that I'm really working on. But honestly, I, wow, I couldn't even tell you how many quilts I've made, but I'm sure that I've made a couple, at least a couple hundred quilts and maybe way more than that. I mean, because many that I've given away. And so there are just too many to try to narrow down into one or two, but I love working with 60 degree shapes. So hexagons, equilateral triangles, 60 degree diamonds and related shapes are absolutely my very favorite shapes to work with. And so probably those quilts at least sort of land at the top of that list just because I love working with those angles so much. 
Oh, fantastic. Uh, Jen, I'm going to ask you the same question. Uh, what would be your favorite all-time project that you've made? Yeah, that is a tough question because I'm sort of the same way. It's sort of whatever I'm working on is my favorite. But um, when I do think about it, I think that my favorite knitting project that I've ever knit is um, a sweater. It's called the Comfort Fade Cardi. Um, it's a pattern that you can find online. Um, and it's knit with, I believe, four different color yarns and you kind of mix them together. It's like to blend them in this really cool way. And I used some beautiful hand dyed yarn. I definitely splurged on that sweater, but it was worth it. It was the first sweater that I made where I felt like it fit perfectly. Like I got done with it and there wasn't anything I wanted to change about the fit of it or anything. Um, it's held up really well and it's just so beautiful. So while I have so many projects, I love when I think about like, what's my absolute favorite thing I've ever knit. I think it's that comfort fade Cardi for sure. I want to make another one. <laughs> All right. The next question is for you as well, Jen. Uh, Janie is asking about German style knitting or European knitting. Janie does both. Would there be a problem with this project? No, I don't think so. I think no matter your knitting style, you should be able to handle doing this project. So if you know how to do a knit and a purl, um, you're going to be good to go. So yeah, it doesn't matter what your knitting style is. This project really is for everybody. All right, I'm going to take this next question. Uh, it comes from Esther, but Esther, I'm sure you're not the only person that is curious. If you joined us late, um, we just introed uh, the idea of next week's projects and they are not just going to be Jen's knitting project and Kelly's quilting project. We will be doing uh, the table runners that Kelly has, but there will also be a sewing zipper pouch project, a cookie decorating demo. Um, we will be doing the dish cloth and placemat that Jen has been previewing and finishing the week out with a quick and easy summer tote bag. So those five projects are what we'll be working on next week. And I will give you the specific details, date and time before we say farewell at the end of today's session, but you can also go ahead and click through all of the um, downloads that you can have for free that are in the link in the chat box already and get some details on what to expect on those projects as well. So that's for anybody that maybe didn't join us right at the top of the hour today. Uh, check out that link in the chat box for a few more details and keep your questions coming. We're going to get to as many as we can before we say farewell and start prepping for next week. Uh, so that means I'm going to send our next question out out there. So Kelly, behind you, we see your quilt, but this is about your craft room. So what does your craft room look like? What do you have in it? How is it laid out? What can you tell us? Uh, my craft room looks like a hot mess. <laughs> so <laughs> You're getting to see the nice, really neat little area here. And otherwise I have stuff everywhere. Um, I will say that I have a nice, healthy fabric stash um, because I am a real collector. And um, when I see a fabric, like somebody asked earlier, I mean, if I see a fabric I love, I get it because I know that if I don't and I, and I don't get it in a few months, it's going to be gone and I will have regretted it. So if I see something I really love, then I add a, at least a little to my stash and sometimes more than a little. But I've got a table with my sewing machine where it's set up all the time. I've got a cutting table set up all the time. I've got an ironing station set up all the time. I've got a table with my AccuQuilt on it that's set up all the time. Uh, I've got a computer down here on a, on a desk and that's set up all the time. I have a design wall that's always ready to go. Um, and then shelves with just where I try to keep stuff either organized by um, project. If, if it's sometimes I find a collection or I curate a collection of fabrics that I already know a specific project I want it for and then I will package those things together um, with a sketch of my idea or whatever, so that when I get to it, I will remember why I set it aside the way that I did. Um, and if I just have purchased some fabrics that I really liked um, without a project, then sometimes I, I have a lot of fabrics that are stored by color and others that are stored by um, fabric line so that I can kind of keep things organized in that way until I start pulling things specifically for a project. And then when I begin a project, it goes in its own tote with whatever I need to go along with it. But um, yeah, it, it's a mess. And I would not even dream of turning my camera around right now for you to see it. So, <laughs> but it's my mess and it's a happy mess and I love it. So 
<laughs> That's fair. We won't ask for that much detail. <laughs> All right, Jen, why don't you tell us about your craft room and uh, what you have going on? Yeah, I'm sort of the same way. You are looking at one little neat, pretty neat corner of my uh, crafting space slash office. So um, I am lucky enough that my house, it was kind of a selling point when we were buying it many years ago. Um, my house actually has a cedar closet in the basement. And um, so that will naturally, uh, you know, repel the bugs and the moths and stuff and the things you don't want in your yarn. So the majority of my yarn is down in the cedar closet. I do obviously have some up here as well. Um, but uh, sort of on the other side of the camera, I have a big desk with my computer. Um, right now I have huge boxes of yarn just sitting over here for something I'm working on for the knitting circle. Um, so yes, it's always, uh, I always feel like my crafting space is a work in uh, progress, really. I'm always rearranging a little bit. Um, but, you know, in my basement, I sort of separate my yarn for the most part by yarn weight. Um, I like, cause I was saying earlier, I like to knit a lot of socks. So I just have like one giant plastic tote. That's just full of sock yarn. Um, and then all the rest of my yarns down here, I tend to have the yarn that's more for work related things sort of up in my office. Cause that's the stuff I need, you know, I'm using quickly. Um, but yeah, I mean, once you get really into a hobby or crafting, typically you're into multiple crafts. So it's, it's very easy to fill up your craft room quickly, actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We're going to do a specific detail question and then jump into another fun, uh, overarching, more general question. So the specific question is going to Kelly here. Uh, Denise is asking an equipment question. So does Denise need a McKay die cutter, like similar to AccuQuilt? Do you need one? Uh, you, you do not need one. Um, and, and there are acrylic templates available, like for the tumbler behind me, you can certainly get an acrylic template and use your rotary cutter and mat to cut your pieces. Um, I just happened to cut this with an AccuQuilt, but I will tell you that if you really get into um, your quilting, an AccuQuilt is something you might wanna look into just because it cuts down your cutting time dramatically, and then you can get to the sewing part much faster. So um, I actually made this for a project that I did through Craftsy in conjunction with AccuQuilt. And so it was a really fun way for me to play with the tumbler die, but you don't have to have a, a die cutting machine, but they can be really big time savers. All right, so that was our specific question. Now we're gonna zoom way out again. Kelly, I'm gonna ask it to you first. Uh, Justine is curious about what was the first project that you worked on where you felt like you were really stepping outside of your comfort zone and what kind of projects have you experimented with? Oh, that's a great question. Well, I would say the first project that I ever felt like I was outside my comfort zone was my very first project. And I remember um, the first quilting class that I took and it actually combined, this was, this was a long time ago. This was like back in the 1980s, a long time ago. I'm sure many of you probably weren't even born yet, but that's a story for another day. But part of what they were doing back then was stenciling on fabric. That was like a really hot thing to do. And so um, I learned how to make a log cabin quilt block but the center square of the log cabin block was quite large and I had stenciled little designs in the center square of those blocks. And um, it was a great learning experience. And I will tell you, and in fact, um, if any of you happen to be watching the, um, the ret online retreat that Craftsy and National Culture Circle did together a, a few months ago, I actually showed that in our little quilt show because I never finished that quilt. And I don't think it's that unusual for a first project to maybe not get done. Um, it was a project that I learned a lot from, but it got set aside. I had little kids at home and I've never gone back to finish it, but I still have it because it means something to me. It was the first quilting project that I ever began to work on. So that definitely stands out to me. Um, but another one that really stands out to me is I knew when I first started making quilts that ultimately I wanted to make a hexagon quilt. And that's because the first quilt that I was given was a grandmother's flower garden quilt made of all hexagons that my paternal grandmother had made for me before she even knew that she was gonna have a grandchild. And so I knew from the time I was a little girl that someday I wanted to learn how to make quilts and I wanted to make a hexagon quilt. 
And so it took me a while in my quilt making journey to start working with hexagons because they tend to be um, a little bit more challenging shapes to work with because they require those set in seams or Y seams to put them together. And so my first quilt that I did using hexagons is also one that really stands out to me because I was terrified and it took me about 15 years into my quilt making process before I finally was brave enough to try it. But now I've never looked back. And I, like I said before, I love working with those shapes. So that was really a turning point for me in my quilt making journey. Oh, all right. I love hearing about getting out of comfort zone. So I'm going to ask the same question to Jen. Uh, just a reminder, this is what your first project was where you felt like you were really stepping out of that comfort zone. And then what other kind of experiments have you tried that you want to share with us? Yeah, I think that for me, um, you know, now in my career as a knit and crochet designer, I'm sort of known for designing shawls. But, you know, there was a time when the idea of knitting a shawl uh, was just absolutely terrifying. I could not understand how you possibly could construct one. And so one of the first shawls that I ever knit was Ishbel by Yasolda Teague. Um, it's still, it's a pattern that you can still find online today, I'm sure. Um, and I felt like when I finished that shawl, um, it was just a simple top down sort of triangle or heart shaped shawl. And it had stockinette at the top and some lace at the bottom. But I felt like when I finished that, um, I, I just felt on top of the world because I just never thought I'd ever figure out how somebody like how you would knit a shawl and sort of have, you know, make a shape that wasn't a square or a rectangle or something. Um, and that really sort of um, made me just fall in love with um, shawls in general and ultimately sort of led me down the path of designing shawls. And so I still love to experiment with shawl design. That's really where my true love is in knitting is all shawls all the time for me, um, as far as designing goes. Um, but I can also remember really wanting to tackle making socks as well. Um, that was something that felt very overwhelming to me as well. Um, and uh, many years ago, maybe in the early 2000s, there was this TV show called Nitty Gritty. I've probably talked about it before on Knitting Circle uh, Lives. And um, there was an episode on knitting socks and I recorded it and I watched it over and over again until I figured it out and uh, was able to uh, move on and make some very fancy sock patterns. And so, yeah, really the shawls and the socks, that's where my love is. That's where I like to experiment when it comes to my knitting. Uh, oh, we have a comment here that's kind of on topic from Ella. Uh, Ella really loves Jen that you're getting into quilting and that Kelly's here to help. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yes, I am. Um, I'm always sending messages to uh, Ashley, who's the managing editor of the National Culture Circle to be like, um, am I doing this right? So yeah, um, I'm trying. I'm slowly but surely uh, getting into it. And everybody's been very encouraging, um, trying to get me into yet another craft. <laughs> well, and I dabble in knitting a little bit. And so, uh, Jen, I may be calling you too. Yeah, so. that's right. We'll just be out all at a group chat helping each other. <laughs> Oh, I just love this. The, uh, Ella says the quilting community is fantastic and all of the crafting communities, I have to say, really pull together to support beginners and crowdsource some troubleshooting for uh, people that might be stepping out of their own comfort zones as well. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> all right. We have some time for just a few more questions. Um, so if you are hanging on to a question and you were thinking, I want mine in at the end, this is your cue. Go ahead and get those questions into the chat box and we will get to a few more before we have to say farewell. Uh, this is another question that I'm gonna send to both Jen and Kelly. Jen, I'm gonna start with you. Uh, when did you first start crafting? What was the thing, the spark that made you go, mm -hmm. mm, I wanna try that? You know, growing up, I was always kind of crafty, but was not necessarily ever into one specific craft that I can remember. Um, and then it was in the early 2000s when I was just out of college that um, my friends had bought me a learn how to knit book uh, for my birthday. And it was at first, it was extremely, fr honestly, frustrating because, um, you know, I was just trying to look at these like diagrams in a book to figure out how to knit and purl. But for me, really, once I got the knit and purl down and started to just understand sort of like how you make knitting fabric, I, I've never felt like that. I don't know, feeling of joy, I guess, in like anything, like even like 
you know, going to college for something totally unrelated to anything, you know, fiber arts related. I don't know. It was just something that once I finally learned how to knit, it was something clicked and it was just like pure happiness. So, (laughs) all right, Kelly, how about you? What was the spark for you that got you started on your crafting quilting journey? Well, I think, you know, just as a child too, I mean, we start out with construction paper and scissors and glue when we're really little and coloring books and colors. And, you know, as you start to develop that, that love of color and using your hands and seeing how it ends up, I think it just rolls from there. I mean, I remember when I was really little making those little woven pot holders and that was just a really fun thing to do. And then there were the, the cards, the cardboard cards and the yarn where you would actually weave through holes in the cardboard to outline the design on the cards. And so there's always been something that I've been involved in. And I did learn to knit very simple things when I was a child from my Aunt Grace, which was just such a wonderful bonding experience but for the two of us as she was teaching me how to do that very simple knitting stitch. In junior high, I learned how to sew clothing, and I sewed a lot of clothing all through high school and even into college. And then after I got out of college um, is when I really decided, okay, it's time. I know I want to be a quilt maker. It's time for me to get into that. But there was also counted cross stitch and just, you know, I've gone through iterations of all different kinds of tactile, sensory, color-driven sorts of art forms. And now, and then similar to Jen, you know, with her knitting, when I hit quilting, it's like, okay, I have found it. There are still other things that I enjoy doing, but my passion really lies with cutting up perfectly good pieces of fabric and stitching them back together into some (laughs) other shape. So it's just what I love to do. All right. I'm going to stay with you, Kelly, for the next question here. Denise, is curious about what happens if you ever get into a creative slump? Uh, How do you reboot that? Oh, that's a really good question. You know, I have to say um, it hadn't ever really happened until early on in the pandemic. And I really did hit a slump. I mean, I had days where it was just like, I had no oomph to do anything because everything around me just seemed so like tilted on its ear, you know, it was just this, as we all know, it was just a really odd time. And so I really did hit um, a real slowdown and for probably at least a month and a half or a couple of months, probably didn't do any sewing. And then all of a sudden I just started to have the urge again. And then you just, I couldn't stop. And so I made so many quilt tops. I have so many quilt tops that are not yet quilted that I made throughout the pandemic because it was just such a way it was a stress reducer for me it was a way to feel like I was accomplishing something when it wasn't I couldn't readily leave the house or or be out a lot Um, and so it it went from having a creative slump to really being a very therapeutic um, situation for me and I'm just so grateful that I had it to turn to because things were pretty stressful there for a while All right, I'm gonna have, I think, time for two more questions. I'm gonna send the next one to Jen here. This one comes in from Brenda. Uh, Brenda's asking, do you stick with one project or do you have a lot of them going at the same time? And if so, how do you manage that? Oh, I have a lot of projects going at the same time. Um, So in addition to knitting and crochet, I also, and starting to dabble in the quilting, I also really love counted cross stitch. And so, yes, I'm somebody that if I get the urge to start a new project, whether it's knitting, crochet, counted cross stitch, um, I pretty much will just start it. And I just kind of over the years, I used to try to be like, oh, no, I'm only going to have five projects or I'm only going to have whatever. But, um, you know, I just found like if I feel like starting something, I just start it, And I try not to get like, I guess, too crazy with it. I try not to have like 20 different pairs of socks going at one time. Um, but I just, I like having a variety of things so I can work on what I feel like working on, you know? Um, and, you know, kind of going back to talking about being in a creative slump, like I have a tendency um, where like, sometimes I want to knit more. Sometimes I want to crochet more. Sometimes I want to cross stitch more or even like read more, you know? So Um, I like having sort of a variety of things to choose from. 
All right, the last question I'm going to give to each of you uh, kind of as a wrap up question. And also, if there's anything else you want to tease about next week, this is going to be your shot. So Jen, first, if there's any final thoughts from today's question and answer session or anything you'd like to share with us about next week's project, uh, this is kind of your chance to air it all out there before we say farewell. Okay, great. You know, like I've been saying this whole time, this project really is beginner friendly. If you are comfortable with knitting, you're going to find this to be a really great, easy project. But I know that with these uh, crafting series that we've been doing here on Craftsy, that we do get a lot of people interested in, you know, beginning knitting projects. And so if you are a beginner, don't be scared. This one, I designed it with you in mind and Really, you just need a few supplies. Like Leah said, you can download the pattern already and there's actually photos in there too. Um, So you can get your supplies ready and uh, we'll be ready for next week. All right, great. I'm gonna give Kelly the same opportunity. So any final thoughts you wanna leave us with and any information that you'd like to share about your project next week, Kelly, here you go. Sure, thanks. Well, I want to say, first of all, I'll just hold hold the one up again so you can see it. And there will be several iterations, several ways to use this unit to create different blocks for this small table runner project. It's a really um, fast project. So it's one that you can pretty much see the light glowing at the end of the tunnel when we begin. And like I said, you would want to have basic rotary cutting skills and just some basic piecing skills. But otherwise, I will be walking you through step by step. And so um, it really is a nice novice project all the way up to somebody that just wants something quick to do to decorate the wall or the table. Um, And I did mention 4th of July earlier, but obviously we do have a lot of you all that are not living in the United States. And so you're not tied to using red, white, and blue. You can use your favorite color combinations. um, And these would be great projects really to focus on for any um, holiday or time of year that you want to highlight. So some winter projects, Halloween projects, you know, I mean, all different kinds of things. So you're sure not locked into the red, white, and blue, just because I sort of thought about that with the fireworks thing. And so it's easily adaptable to whatever your favorite color combinations are. And I think it'll be a really fun, enjoyable time together. All right, thank you so much for giving us that last little bit of a sneak preview. Uh, I have to say before I let you go, I have just a little bit of housekeeping to finish up with. So first, thank you to Jen and Kelly for joining us, providing those sneak peeks of their projects for next week's Summer Crafting Party mini series and answering all of the questions that you were able to ask here today. Of course, that means that you've got to make sure you come back. You wanna join us starting Monday, June 21st at 2 p.m that's central time for the very first live demonstration of the mini series. And then you'll check back each day next week for new projects. Make sure that you download your free patterns and instructions right now to prepare for the live instruction next week. Now the link is in the description, but I'm going to run you through the series schedule so you know exactly what to expect. All of the start times are 2 p.m. Central Time, and on Monday, we'll be working on a fireworks fun table runners. You've seen that sneak peek here. On Tuesday at 2 p.m. Central Time, bomb pop popsicle zipper pouches. Uh, So that will be a sewing project that you'll join us for that day. On Wednesday, we're going to bake or decorate some cookies. So a little bit of a baking project there for you. That's also at 2 p.m. Central, Uncle Sam and Gnome cookie decorating demos that day. Thursday, we'll be doing Summer Stripes Knitted Dish Cloth, if I could speak properly, Dish Cloth and Placemat. That was another sneak preview that you had in today's session. And then we'll finish out the week on Friday, again at 2 p.m. Central, with your quick and easy summer tote bag. So those are the projects that you have to look forward to next week. You can find the entire mini series schedule in the description, and we hope you'll be joining us for a fun week of DIY summertime projects. With that said, on behalf of the entire team, Jen and Kelly and all of the instructors for next week, we can't wait to see you on Monday to 